he would just hold it up and cry for like minutes. That's weird. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. If you are new here, hi. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if you're into that and weird combinations in general, you are in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't ever miss an upload. Today's story was recommended by a viewer here on YouTube named Annie. Thank you, Annie. This one is a doozy. We are continuing our tour of the United States, but before we find out where we're going and what the terrible story is, today's video is sponsored by Care Of. Care Of is a wellness brand that ships high quality, personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders to your door every month. My stress levels have been off the charts for the past couple of months. Work stuff, family stuff, selling the house, moving. It's a lot for anybody to handle and it can be really hard on your health. Care Of takes the guesswork out of choosing the right things to help me keep my body healthy. You just take a simple quiz. They provide a personalized recommendation of vitamins, supplements, and powders to suit your specific needs. My little combination includes a multivitamin with iron for just like general wellness. My diet has been like exclusively takeout for longer than I would like to admit, so mm, this helps out. It also includes collagen to help improve skin elasticity and keratin for my hair. I also have this unflavored collagen powder that I just mixed in with my coffee. There's also these quick dissolving probiotic powders to help give my gut health a little boost. Care of is different from other vitamins because it's so personalized. If your health goals change or you wanna start focusing on specific issues like sleep, fitness, or even prenatal, they got you covered. I love these little daily vitamin packs because first of all, the package is compostable, which is really nice. They're travel friendly and there's a little thoughtful nugget on each one that's different every day. So it makes it easy to remember to take it because I wanna know what it says. <laughs> take care of's quiz to find out what's recommended for you and use my code red 50 to save 50% on your first order. Thanks again to Care Of for sponsoring today's terrible story. Let's get back to it. In today's story, we are headed to the very first state to institute a statewide income tax. Thanks a lot. It's the Badger State. It's the Cheese State. It's the troll capital of the world. It's the home state of our favorite world famous drag queen with a passion for makeup artistry. Tracy Martell. <laughs> oh, hey, you better sissy that walk. Oh yeah, we're going to Wisconsin. This is the story of Father Ryan Erickson. I feel like this one's gonna be long because the script is long. That's what she said. <laughs> Hudson, Wisconsin is a sleepy little town in the northwest part of the state right near the border of Minnesota. It's about 15 minutes away from Minneapolis, you know, Twin Cities. Population is pretty small, you know, 10,000 or so, and maybe even a little less around the time that this happened, which was 2002. It's the kind of town where it's small enough that everybody knows everybody and nobody locks their doors, you know, that kind of vibe. In North Hudson, they host the annual Pepper Fest. It started in 1950s as like a, a fundraiser to build a school, but um, it has continued to this day. It's adorable. There's a royal court, there's a spaghetti eating contest, a pepper eating contest, music, bingo, just fun. I love stuff like this. So up until this event happened, uh, the last homicide was 24 years before. So, I mean, there's hunters and sportsmen, of course. So there's maybe some gun incidents, maybe a couple of suicides, but it's not, not a murder place. On February 5th, 2002, at about 1.40 p.m., Marty Shacklin, the St. Croix County Medical Examiner, stopped by the O'Connell Funeral Home to finish up some death certificates, a, a routine chore. He worked really closely with the owner and director, Dan O'Connell, and it was pretty typical of him to drop by without an appointment. When he entered the building, it was pretty quiet, but also... It's a funeral home. When he walked into the office, he found 39-year-old Dan O'Connell and his 22-year-old intern, James Ellison. They had both been shot to death. Fearing that the killer might still be in the building, he ran out and called the police right away. So when the call came in to report two dead bodies at the funeral home, and you know, not for the typical reasons, 
Everyone came to the scene, and I mean everyone. There hadn't been a homicide in so long, and they weren't sure what they were looking at or whether the person was still on the premises. This kind of thing did not happen in their town, ever, and crowds gathered as police taped off the scene. The dispatcher called for basically all hands on deck. They sent an ambulance, a fire truck, police, air surveillance, and like a full SWAT team. They wanted to make sure that they had everything covered, the scene was secured, but they found nothing. The Hudson police got busy processing the scene. Dan O'Connell was slumped over his desk, sitting in the chair with a bullet wound in his forehead. It looked like Dan had like started to get up from the chair, but the gunshot had knocked him back down into like a sitting position. James was on the floor also with a gunshot to the head. He had actually been shot twice. The detective said that it looked like James had approached with like papers in his hands, you know, likely because he'd heard that first gunshot and ran in to see what was going on and then must have raised his hands like defensively papers everywhere. The bullet had gone actually through his pinky finger and into his forehead too. It's a little gruesome, but they had responded so quickly that blood was still coming out. While they investigated the scene, they did find three nine millimeter bullet casings, but not much else. So who were these men? I'm glad you asked. Daniel O'Connell was born on February 23rd, 1962 in St. Paul, Minnesota to Thomas and Janet O'Connell. He grew up in Hudson in a devout Catholic family. He graduated from Hudson High School in 1981. While he was a senior at Hudson High School, Dan became certified as an emergency medical technician, EMT. On October 22nd, 1988, he married Jenny Jo McKnight at St. Michael's Catholic Church in Minnesota. They later welcomed two children to the family, a boy named Kyle and a girl named Caitlin. He worked as an EMT with the Hudson Ambulance Service, but he eventually decided that it was time to join the family business. O'Connell's Funeral Home. In 1992, he graduated with honors from the University of Minnesota School of Mortuary Science. He enjoyed working with his brother and father, and he was very committed to the community, like super involved in charities and fundraisers. I guess that's the same thing, right? Anyway. He was an active member of the Chamber of Commerce, the Knights of Columbus, the Rotary Club, and he served as a Pepperfest King. Dan coordinated the 9-11 Relief Spaghetti Dinner Fundraiser, and he was very proud that he and his family fed over 2,200 people and raised over $25,000 to help the underserved. Dan loved his work and he loved his town. He was a devoted father. He was always present at his kids' school and sports activities. People from the town would later say that meeting Dan was like you were a friend for life. This guy was like good. He was a good person, like down to the bones. All of the same lovely things are true for James as well. James was born on October 22nd, 1979 in Minneapolis, Minnesota to Karsten and Sally Ellison. He grew up in rural Barron, Wisconsin, and he graduated from Barron High School. While growing up, James was in the school band. He was the president of the Future Business Business Leaders of America. He was on the golf team and also 4-H. For two years, he attended the University of Wisconsin River Falls and then transferred to University of Minnesota to study mortuary science. And he was actually on track to graduate that May. He had served as an apprentice in the year 2000 for the Roush Rockman Funeral Home in Barron, but then he later interned with the O'Connell Funeral Home because he wanted to learn from the best. UM actually did award James his degree posthumously with his class three months after his death. When James was in school, he had a part-time job cleaning the house of a local family and he became a mentor for their sons. He would take the boys rollerblading, bowling and golfing. James was like a person who always wanted to help those in need and he was just a good friend. He also had a girlfriend that he planned to marry. You know, he was just so young and really had his entire life ahead of him. Dan O'Connell's funeral was held on the 9th of February at St. Patrick's Church in Hudson. It was presided over by Father Ryan Erickson. To this day, it's considered to be the largest funeral ever held in Hudson. So you get it. You know, these two guys were basically saints. Who on earth would wanna hurt them? Both of these men were shot at close range you know, very purposefully by somebody who knew what they were doing. Well, the detectives, of course, were wondering the same thing. First, they looked into Dan. Was he having an affair? No. Was his wife having an affair? No. 
Was there like some elaborate wild insurance, life insurance policy? No. There was a life insurance policy, but it was, you know, modest and it paid out over time. So that could not be a motivation. Dan's wife, Jenny, also had a pretty rock solid alibi. She was home all day decorating the house for their son's birthday party that night. So Dan had a female coworker named Bonnie and sometimes they would travel together. So maybe Bonnie had a jealous husband. Well, they talked to her husband, his name was Dwayne and he admitted he was jealous. He had a rock solid alibi, so wasn't him. Well, what about a robbery? Funeral homes don't keep cash on hand. Maybe somebody was trying to steal the embalming fluid so they could like get high from it. Embalming fluid's not difficult to get and it's also not expensive, so. Also none was missing. Did Dan maybe have a disgruntled business partner? Again, no. Okay, what about this intern, James? Baby 22 year old James. Well, he was squeaky clean. The detectives really couldn't find anyone or anything that would indicate that somebody had a problem with either of these guys. Well, sometime later, the detectives were contacted by the FBI. They had been tracking some like weirdo religious group. They were located about an hour and a half from Hudson in Augusta, Wisconsin. The group was called the Rest of Jesus Ministry. Their main gig was that they really opposed embalming. So embalming is, if you don't know, it's the practice of preserving a dead body to, you know, delay the process of decomposition. It makes a dead person look maybe a little less dead so they can be presentable for a funeral. So anyways, this group, the rest of Jesus ministry, they were aggressively against embalming and they said that draining the blood from the body is an abomination. They believe that bodies should be covered only like in a light sheet like a shroud, and presented like that only, and then, you know, quickly buried. They sent out letters to over 400 funeral homes. They would address them to, quote, my people who deal with corpses. They would say, you know, what they were doing was wrong, and, quote, failure to comply will bring a judgment of much death upon this land. Okay. In another letter they had found, written from this group, it said, because you have heard not the words of the Lord, I take from you your sons and daughters into early graves. Prepare for burial yourself. That sounds threatening to me. Well, these detectives agreed, of course, and they drove from Hudson to interview the leader of the group. It was a woman, 55-year-old Kathy Padilla. She had also apparently in the past been arrested for stalking, disorderly conduct. She told them that she was a profit to 25 adults and kids and she held meetings every Saturday in her home where she read religious text and would speak in tongues. I said out loud, Shamala Hamala, <laughs> and everyone around me was like, oh my god, it's happening. Okay, Shamala Hamala. So when they asked her about these pamphlets and letters, she said, well, that you're taking that out of context. And she denied any involvement with the Hudson shootings. I mean, maybe stop sending threatening letters. <laughs> Call me crazy. She actually was arrested in connection with these threats and they executed a search warrant for her home, but they found nothing that would connect her to Dan O'Connell and James Ellison or the funeral home besides the threatening letters. Also, she did have a verified alibi, so she was ruled out. Well, shit. All right, so kooky Kathy was eliminated as a suspect. The case went cold. A year went by. Jenny O'Connell said that this time was very hard because she felt like she couldn't trust anybody in the town. She had no idea who murdered her husband. So after one year, Sharon O'Connell, Dan's sister, wrote to the VDOC Society for help. So the VDOC Society is a crime-solving group of interested people based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They solved their first case in 1991. The society is named after Eugene Francois VDOC the groundbreaking 19th century French detective who helped police by using the psychology of the criminal to help solve cold cases. So Vidoc was previously a criminal himself and he used his knowledge of the criminal mind to like put himself in the shoes of the bad guy. Anyways, the members of this Vidoc society are like forensic professionals, you know, psychologists, prosecutors, coroners. They all use their expertise to help, you know, solve cases that 
have gone cold for at least two years. So this group only takes on one case a year, but they have a 90% success rate, so they're not fucking around. So when Sharon first wrote to them, the case wasn't eligible yet, it had only been a year. But by the time two years passed, things had changed. Meanwhile, the Hudson police detectives that had been assigned to the case, Detectives Petty and Walters, they hadn't stopped investigating, of course. Around the two-year mark, they had actually started to reinvestigate old leads, you know? Colleagues, co-workers, associates of Dan O'Connell, anybody that they could connect him to. And they all had alibis. I mean, all but, all but one person, but he was a priest. So who was this priest? Father Ryan Erickson was born on January 17th, 1973 in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin to Dennis and Mary Roth Erickson. He grew up in Campbellsport, and he actually had kind of a rough childhood. His dad was a prison guard and he was an alcoholic, you know, regularly got really drunk and was out of hand, abusive to the family. You know, his mother, I think he had a brother as well. Growing up, Ryan was athletic. He took part in wrestling and football and cross country track. When he was 17, Ryan's father, his job was transferring to another city. So Ryan didn't want to leave his school. Instead, he stayed behind and lived with a priest named Michael Morin. Well, this Michael really had an impression on Ryan, and this is where he got really serious about his faith, his Catholic faith, like really serious. So he actually adopted a pretty dogmatic viewpoint belief system, you know? If anyone ever questioned him, debated him at all, he would become aggressive to the point of being angry. He graduated from Campbellsport High School in May of 1992. Well, the summer after graduation, the now 18-year-old Ryan was at the Eagle River Campground in Wisconsin, and he was running around with 14, 15-year-old boys. You can see where this is going. So he told this young boy, this 14, 15 year old boy, stories about the devil and gave him a massage and then also fondled his swimsuit area. When Ryan offered the boy some mouth action, the boy refused. When he went back home, he told his mom, she called the police, but then she sent her son to therapy because she thought he was questioning his orientation. The police actually did look into it but they determined that the boy was unreliable and no charges were made. So Ryan also worked at the campground bar that summer. He was caught stealing alcohol. He was fired and he left the campground shortly after that. Years later, an anonymous caller contacted the Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper and told them all about how Ryan sexually assaulted him when he was 15 years old. He claimed that they watched some porn together and then they fell asleep and when he woke up, Ryan was molesting him. Now, since the caller was anonymous, nobody really knows if it's the same kid or if it's a different one. So some of Ryan's classmates in school thought he was funny and charming, but Ryan's closer friends definitely saw a different side to him. They said that Ryan was openly racist and also abusive to animals. We all know that's a major, major red flag. One person said that they saw Ryan throw a cat in the air and take a shot at it. Also, he would flood the gopher holes around his home, and then when the little gophers would come out, he would whack them over the head. Like real life whack-a-mole, Wh whack a gopher. Ryan also prided himself on this little miniature electric chair that he had built for these gophers. <laughs> Same person who was like super religious, was very much into like torturing and killing animals. Okay, so what's the natural next step for anyone who's a thieving, racist, animal abusing shithead? Go to the seminary. All right, so the requirements to enter the seminary, to study to become a priest. The requirements are the candidate must be male, they must be in good physical health, they should have graduated high school or be within one year of graduating from high school, they need to be baptized and confirmed a Catholic, there can be no marital obligations, and they must undergo a psychological examination. Well, that's good, right? According to the official records from the diocese, in July of 1992, Ryan did undergo a psychological evaluation, and in that, he admitted that when he was about six years old, he had sexual contact with a four-year-old 
nephew. Ryan also admitted that he had sexual contact with a 14-year-old boy when he was 19. This self-admitted pattern of sexual deviance was taken very seriously and he was immediately disqualified from eligibility. Just kidding, he was absolutely allowed to continue and he was admitted into the seminary. In fact, it was determined by Dr. Anthony Melozzi that Ryan was, quote, problem-free and appeared healthy, psychologically stable, and would make an outstanding priest. I'll tell you who has problems is that evaluator. Okay, anyways, Ryan was sent off to study at the Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary, which is part of um, St. Mary's University of Minnesota in Winona, Minnesota. Fun fact, small world. My cousins graduated from there, not the seminary. St. Mary's. <laughs> kind of around the same time. I wonder if they knew this guy. I should call him. Anyways, in 1994, the bishop um, slash vocation director of the um, superior diocese was contacted by a district attorney regarding the 1992 incident with Ryan that took place at the campground. When he was confronted by church officials, Ryan said, that's not true. He was removed from all work until the investigation was completed. Also, the church leadership wanted Ryan to get professional counseling and testing from a clinical psychologist because that seems to be taken so seriously. He did see a therapist and continued seeing that therapist for two years, but in 1994, that district attorney's office decided that they would not file charges. Since there was no witnesses, they couldn't corroborate the event. Ryan's most recent psychological evaluation determined that he was still a suitable candidate to continue on with the seminary program, and he would make a caring priest. Gag. The report said that his, quote, Inappropriate sexual behavior was not a significant part of his psychology, and he was not predatory, not at high risk for acting sexually aggressive. There's also some other reports of some other disciplinary actions against Ryan, but they were unspecified. But around the same time, Ryan suddenly became like a traditionalist. He started wearing a cassock, which is like the full length, like ankle length black garment like a dress, sort of, that you see priests wearing. It's not typical for the younger people to be wearing this. But anyways, his fellow seminarians started calling him the Monsignor because he was so conservative. Funny enough, Ryan was actually a heavy drinker, and he got into a bit of trouble during his semester in Israel. The seminary got reports that Ryan went out drinking every night. He claimed that he was attending AA and he promised to abstain from alcohol, which he did not do. He was also known as a practical joker. You know, he was counseled about the appropriateness of his humor and jokes. Gosh, what did you say, little Susie? I want to be a prostitute. Oh, thank God. I thought you said Protestant. Much of it was like sarcastic and mean-spirited. Not, not super priestly. Later on, he adopted a dog, like a rescue dog, and he named it the Beast. Beat this dog mercilessly. Ryan also smoked cigars, and the dog had scars on its ears from the burns. You get it? Do we hate this guy enough? <laughs> so it's time for Ryan to graduate. I guess there's a vote and there was a 14 to one vote in his favor. Apparently the one person who voted no was one of the professors or mentors, leaders, whatever, that stated that Ryan was manipulative and does not take responsibility for his own actions. I mean, at least one person sees him for who he is. But, you know, the vote was passed by the majority and he did graduate. And on June 4th, 2000, Ryan was officially ordained as a Catholic priest. St. Anne's Church in Somerset, Wisconsin. He was then assigned to St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is how he got there. Father Ryan quickly established himself as a conservative, rigid, headstrong priest. He was particularly focused on sexual sin, telling people that masturbation and contraception and adopt, not adoption, abortion, were like mortal sins. He wore that traditional cassock, like I described earlier, and he gave mass in Latin. Super duper traditional. He denounced lukewarm Catholics. He ranted about women wearing immodest clothing. Like, how dare they advertise themselves? Anyways, he was just, like, very judgy, which kind of checks out. Also, 
His style of sermon was very, very dramatic. He would often break down, like weeping in the middle of it. During uh, the Eucharist, it's the part of the Catholic Mass where they do the Holy Communion, he would dramatically hold up the host. We call that the elevation because at this moment it is now the body of Christ. So the host is like the little wafer thing, right? He would just hold it up and cry for like minutes. That's weird. Catholic mass is already really long. Ain't nobody got time for that. You know what? Some of the parishioners were really into it. They appreciated his devotion and they saw him as dedicated and very faithful to the Catholic faith. Well, other people were like weirded out by this. It's weird, you know? Like, why was he so intense? Why was he crying all the time? Also, girls were conspicuously absent from like church events and retreats. And he was spending a lot of time with the altar boys. He was also very pushy about the parish children coming to him for confession. It was all just like very controlling. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier, he was very much into guns and he enjoyed target shooting, sport shooting, and it was said that he would even wear a gun, like a gun belt, under his cassock. These lashes are doing nothing. I need different lashes. Okay, so we are caught up with Father Ryan and how he ended up in Hudson, but what did detectives know at this point? So around the same time that they started looking into Father Ryan, you know, because he had no alibi, they were contacted by detectives in Bismarck, North Dakota about an investigation that they needed some help with. So there was a 20-year-old man who used to live in Hudson who was now going to college in North Dakota. He said that he had taken a psychology class and it talked about how pedophiles groom young children to get them to, you know, not only accept what's happening to them, but to make them feel like they can't talk about it either. And the man realized that something happened to him when he was a child in Hudson. So he decided to come forward and make a report to local police. You know, of course he was reluctant to do it because it involved someone that he really trusted, his parish priest, Father Ryan Erickson. So the young man traveled back to Hudson to speak with detectives and he told them all about how often Father Ryan would have young boys over to the rectory and he would ply them with lots and lots of alcohol. They would play drinking games, get white girl wasted, and the boys would sometimes throw up or pass out. The boy, well the young man, said that he remembered at least 10 times where he was alone with Father Ryan, drinking a lot of beer and hard liquor and things would get fuzzy. And then he would fall asleep and wake up to being molested. He talked about how Father Ryan loved guns and the boy described the priest standing at the window, this is crazy, standing at the window, holding his gun, aiming it down at the parishioners down on the sidewalk and like mock shooting them. I don't like that lady, boom. I don't like that man, boom. <laughs> Well, detectives knew that they were onto something, so they approached the good father for an interview. Now, by this point, the church had moved him from Hudson twice. In September of 2003, while still in Hudson, Father Ryan was observed by parishioners crying, crying in the sacristy, um, which is like, like the backstage area of the church. They said he was openly weeping over abortion. This weird encounter was reported to the diocese and Ryan was transferred to Our Lady of Sorrows Parish in Ladysmith, Wisconsin, which is about two hours northeast of Hudson. In August of 2004, after the bishop and Lady Smith complained about Ryan's drinking, oh yeah, he was drunk in the other incident, by the way. He was transferred again, this time to St. Mary of the Seven Dollars Parish in Hurley, Wisconsin. Now Hurley is like a tiny, tiny, tiny town way up north. Well, in this first interview with detectives, Father Ryan was asked about the report that he would regularly drink with young boys. And he didn't deny it at all. He said that he was teaching them how to drink responsibly. <laughs> okay, so getting shit-faced at 
age 14 is fine as long as you do it with the priest. They did ask him if there was ever a scenario where one of these boys drank so much that they vomited, and he told them a story. He explains that he helped the boy get into the shower, and he took off his clothes and washed them, and then he dressed him and put him into bed. Okay, there's, there's a big hole in that story because that's not like a quick thing. Was the boy in the shower the entire time that his clothes were being washed and dried? There was no admission of like a nude child in a bed, his bed. Well, anyways, the investigators then dropped the bomb. What about the murders in Hudson? And he told them of Dan, well, I heard that he was shot at his desk. And James, I heard he was shot in the doorway. Well, the investigators tried really hard to like not give each other looks because there's no way that he could have known this because that particular information was not known to the public. They asked him, where did you hear this? And he said, oh, but on the news or, you know, maybe in the newspaper? Well, we got a problem here, Padre, because um, this is what they in the biz like to call guilty knowledge. Like I said, it's information about a crime that's not released to the public and oftentimes is even not even known within the police force. Only five people in this investigation knew about the actual position of the bodies when they were found. The detectives said that in the 1900 interviews that they've done about this case, not one person has ever given them that information because it's something that only the killer would know. Well, they asked him point blank, if you did this and knew that you could get away with it, would you tell us? And he says, well, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would probably get away with it. That's human nature. You would try to get away with it. Ryan, you're a priest, bro. There's rules about this. It's like one of the top 10 rules. All right, also Father Ryan's alibi for that time of the murder, you know, between 12.30 and about 1.30, he was supposed to be at the rectory working on his computer. Remember that. So after that little interview, Father Ryan told Faye Lindgren, the deacon's wife, that he was, quote, not going to jail, and that he'd heard stories about what happens in prison. And he said, I won't let that happen. Do you know what they do to young guys in prison? Especially priests? Okay, so let's go back to VDOC. So at this point, it's been two years since the murders. So they were contacted by the Hudson police, and one of the founders, Richard Walters, he was a master profiler and he took a special interest in the case after hearing about it and he flew to Hudson with two other VDOC members. Richard studied the crime scene and he saw a scene that lacked emotion. You know, this was a shooter that was detached from the victims who wanted to exert their power. He said there was no anger and no overkill. This was a cold as ice calculated murder. These investigators interviewed Father Ryan one additional time on December 7th, 2004, and they asked him more questions about his knowledge of the crime. And they wanted also to ask Ryan if he'd be willing to take a lie detector test. He said, oh, yes, of course. It was scheduled for the next day, but then he called to let detectives know that his attorney, attorney, didn't want him to take the test. Fair, don't take lie detector tests ever. So as a result of the things that were revealed in those interviews with him, the detectives were able to get a probable cause search warrant for Father Ryan's home, including his computer. Father Ryan, in the meantime, was real busy calling his friends in Hudson, asking for an alibi to cover him for February 5th, 2002. Two days later, police showed up at his door to execute that search warrant, and they found 16 guns, including two 9mm handguns, they immediately were sent to the lab for processing. They also seized his computer and they found lots of interesting images. Use your imagination. It's exactly what you're imagining. Disgusting. He also had some software installed on his computer that was meant to wipe that hard drive, but it apparently didn't work. On December 17th, 2004, two of Father Ryan's good friends, Richard Reams and Tom Burns, came to visit him. They knew that the police had been poking around and asking a lot of questions, 
and they wanted to make sure that their friend was okay. Father Ryan seemed uneasy and upset, but you know, they did go to dinner and a movie and they stayed overnight in the rectory with Father Ryan. The next morning, the three of them got up. Ryan seemed like his normal self. Richard went downstairs to start his truck. Remember, it's December in Wisconsin, everything's freezing. He saw something that stopped him. It looked like a body hanging by the neck. Well, Richard yelled out to the maintenance man that was clearing the snow from the sidewalk, Father Ryan has hung himself. And the man replied, oh no, that's just a dummy. He's always playing pranks on me. It was not a joke. Father Ryan Erickson had hung himself and he did leave a note. He actually left three notes on the table. He had also left on the table the crown of thorns ring that he always wore. It was a gift from them a couple Christmases before. So in, in the notes, he like doubled down on his innocence. None of my guns matched those from the murder. None of my DNA was found. There were no witnesses that saw me leaving the funeral home. I mean, I don't know how he would know any of that at this point because the results had not been returned yet, but okay. The VDOC experts analyzed the suicide notes and pointed out that they're full of excuses and contradictions, you know, like how he could never kill anyone, anything, but then he was planning to kill himself. He tried to present himself as a beleaguered servant of God, but he just wanted to selfishly escape from the consequences of his actions. Shit, man, you know, like the police's one suspect in this case the one that they've got a decent amount of evidence for, has killed himself. That's kind of the end of that, right? Not in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, they do something called John Doe investigations. It's kind of like a grand jury investigation, right? In a grand jury, the prosecutor brings the case before a group of jurors and they present the witnesses and the evidence and the arguments. And at the end of the hearing, the jurors kind of decide if there's enough evidence to proceed to the next step like to go to trial, right? Essentially, like, does the state have enough proof? So the St. Croix County District Attorney Eric Johnson was able to present the state's case, including new witness testimony. On October 3rd, 2005, a total of 15 witnesses testified during the one day hearing. So the morning that Dan was murdered, he actually ran into a friend named Mary Pagel, who was a school bus driver at the coffee shop. During their conversation, Dan asked Mary if she had ever noticed Father Ryan acting inappropriately with the children. I mean, of course, Mary said no, she had not. No, she hadn't, but it was obvious that Father Ryan ignored the girls, but gave a lot of attention to the boys. Well, she could tell that Dan was very upset by whatever information that he had. And Dan told her that he actually had a meeting that day with the priest to talk to him about it. And Mary said, I don't think you want to do that. Just go to the authorities and let them hash it out. Well, Dan said, no, 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 I can handle it. During Mary's testimony, she also said that she saw Father Ryan leaving the church dressed in regular clothing, opposed to his regular cassock, which was strange because he never wasn't wearing the cassock. The young man who was in college in North Dakota also testified. The young man who was going to college in North Dakota, remember him, he also testified about the things that he saw in the rectory. Another eyewitness testified that they saw a car similar to Father Ryan's parked outside the funeral home at the time of the murders. The detectives testified that Father Ryan knew crime scene details that only the killer would know, such as how many bullets were fired and the positions of the victims' bodies when they were found. Russell Lundgren, the deacon at St. Mary's Church, testified that after detectives had interviewed Father Ryan, he heard him say, do you know what they do to young guys in prison to priests. Remember that? He actually said that to his wife, but this person heard it too. He also said, fuck, I done it and they're gonna get me. So when the deacon asked him, what are you talking about? He said that Ryan was staring out the window the whole time and they never made eye contact and never discussed it again. The prosecutor outlined a very convincing motive that Father Ryan was terrified of his sexual assault history being made public and having to face the congregation as well as prison time and that James just was murdered wrong place, wrong time. Judge Eric Lundell said, quote, I conclude that Ryan Erickson probably committed these crimes in question, and on a scale of 1 to 10 as far as strength of evidence, I would consider this a 10. 
The judge also ruled that it was just as likely that Ryan had sexually assaulted, at the very least, the young man who had testified. After this hearing, nobody from the diocese contacted Dan O'Connell's widow to offer condolences or apologies. As a matter of fact, the only member of the clergy who even bothered to call on Mrs. O'Connell after the murder of her husband was Father Erickson. What? The O'Connell and Ellison families did set out to finish what Dan started. You know, a plan to reform policies in the Catholic Church regarding molestation by clergy members. The O'Connells filed suit against all 194 U.S. Catholic bishops, demanding that all of the names of the predatory priests be made public. That case was dismissed in 2007. The Ellison family filed a wrongful death suit against the Catholic Diocese of Superior, alleging that they knew that Father Erickson was unfit to serve. The church was then responsible for his actions that led to their son's death. In 2008, that case was dismissed. I mean, are we surprised? No. If you or someone you know has been impacted by abuse or sexual violence by a church member, it is not your fault. Please check down in the description box for more information and support resources. Help is out there, friends. On a positive note, James's family founded a scholarship in his honor at the University of Minnesota School of Mortuary Science so that each year his legacy could live on in those who are committed to helping others during the most difficult times of their lives. And that, friends, is the story of Father Ryan Erickson. <coughs> Thanks again to Care Of for sponsoring today's video. Check the description box below for the link to the quiz and use my code RED50 to save 50% on your order. If you want to know what kind of makeup I used in today's video, just check down below because everything is linked. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! This is a terrible story. Hello? Hi. Contacted the mini Minneapolis. Where's that? All right. By the O'Connell. <laughs> if you want to see what kind of music, music, music. Okay, love you too. Bye. Take tear, take, 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 ta, 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 ta.